Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, a program dedicated to exploring the contributions of archaeology in the Middle East to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark. I direct the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University and am joined by three distinguished gentlemen, all with a bit of archaeology in their blood <laughs> and biblical studies as well. Mm -hmm. Larry Garrity, uh, a, a, a co-host of this program and um, connected with La Sierra for, since back to what, 1993. 1993. Mm -hmm. A long connection there and a prosperous one. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. All kinds of <laughs> gratitude goes to you for your work. Thanks for the help for many of those years with my provost. That's correct. <laughs> um, Warren Trenchard is uh, currently a professor of New Testament and early Christianity, but was uh, provost for how many years? Six years. For six years. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. so. And then Dr. Kent Bramlett, who is an associate professor of archaeology and the history of antiquity at La Sierra. So we are doing Colossians teamed up with Philemon. I think I've said that correctly. Mm -hmm. There are different ways of pronouncing these things. Maybe it's a good idea to think about why we're doing those two together. What, what would be a good explanation for why we're doing this, Warren? Well, there are a number of uh, convergence points between these two documents. Um, the, the person who's the, the, the focal point of the letter to Philemon is Philemon's former slave who has run off and eventually found him his way to Paul. Uh, his name is Onesimus. Onesimus is also mentioned in the letter to the Colossians. Uh, when Paul addresses the letter to Philemon, he, he mentions uh, a couple of people right at the beginning who seem to be all related. Maybe it's Philemon and his wife and son or something like that. But a, the church in Colossa meets in their home. And that person who's possibly the son is also mentioned in, in Colossians. Colossians then would seem to be the hometown and home church of Philemon and ultimately of Onesimus. <laughs> Incredible collection uh, or connections, and so that's a good reason to pull. Them and it together. seems as though, in Paul, when Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians and sent it to them, he also sent along this letter to uh, Philemon because he mentions the person who's carrying both. And in both, he says, "I am writing this with my own hand," which may be just a part of it. I've heard you explain this before. Maybe just a part of it. Uh, or m maybe we need to th see it in part, as part of a wider scribal tradition of how these things were produced. But in any case, we have Paul's own hand, um, at least as he's expressing it. All or parts of these two letters were written by Paul personally. Right, 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 right. We have some artifacts before we turn to a number of slides that we want to look at in this particular episode. Kent, you have some, um, <coughs> you, you don't have inscriptions in front of you, which I, I feel a little bit bad about that because I know how much you like inscriptions, but we've moved them off the table and you have some more artifacts in front of you. Well, these are interesting <laughs> too, these very small vessels, uh, very common in uh, Roman times, certainly in burials. And, uh, we assume that they had valuable contents. Again, a small package with very high value contents. Uh, very narrow opening. This one is quite elaborate. It has a very long, narrow base. But again, you wouldn't put much quantity in these, but the quality is very high. Again, perfumes, unguents, um, different kinds of natural oils that have, have been extracted from everything from balsam and other uh, natural uh, plants and then would be distributed for funerary purposes or simply perfumes. Oh, perfumes. <coughs> Larry, we have some ceramics in the middle that Paul might have recognized, That's or might right. be able to recognize. That's right. <coughs> Very common things that you would find um, in the kitchen or the dining room or on an eating table, um, things that carried um, liquids, uh, bowls, lamps, um, juglets, all things that you would find in the cupboard. In the typical. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming by the looks of it that most of this was fairly standard. Right. We, we, I don't know that we have Nothing a lot of unusual. elite. No. Uh, so I'm thinking about the elite goods too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Except maybe glass would, although glass seems to be spread fairly widely socioeconomically too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we do have a glass uh, artifact here um, on an this inkwell. end of the table. An inkwell, 
with a stylus that mm -hmm. would have been used to apply it to papyrus. And we actually have um, a piece of papyrus here that mm -hmm. has been inked. Mm -hmm. And papyrus, we've talked about before, the first material, the first, at least primary material using, used for writing the New Testament letters, what become at least part of the Bible as we think about it. So papyrus becomes important and not only does text. it originate in Egypt, but it is preserved in Egypt because Egypt uh, sands are so dry. Right, now. so they can stay there. Mm. And then a couple of other juglets here too. We want to turn our attention though to some slides. We are slide intensive <laughs> with this particular episode because there are a number of things we want to cover in the treatment of Colossians and of Philemon. And we will do our normal thing and think geopolitically and chronologically, give us a setting. It is interesting that with New Testament books, especially the letters of Paul, we don't have a long time span here, do we? No. Uh, we work, Kent and Larry and I work in the Old Testament, and we have, uh, you know, centuries to mm -hmm. work with. Here we're working with a couple of decades, and that is, I don't, I don't know that it's limiting, but what it does allow us to do is to focus a bit more tightly, and there are so many artifacts, especially written ones, mm -hmm. from this time period. A lot of information coming from a very short time. Yes, exactly. And so if we think about this, our map person, Kent, is going to locate Colossi for us. Pretty easy this time. You've <laughs> kindly framed them in two squares, two rectangles, right. the red one and the yellow one. That's right. <laughs> and I, I was thinking with the red one of this collection. The larger area. Uh, where you have uh, Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossi. Um, and we have, we have reference, but it's not in one of these letters to an epistle or to a letter to the Laodiceans. But that's in Corinthians, isn't it? Actually, Doug, it's in this letter we're dealing it's with. It's in the tonight. Colossians yeah. one. Right. Oh, they both start with C, okay? Right. So, okay, I was close, okay. So that uh, then gives us a sense of, of a regional group of cities, maybe churches, certainly originally house churches, but a region now that we're thinking, a district. This a is, district yes, of churches. That's right. This and of course, if we're thinking of uh, the book of uh, Revelation uh, or the apocalypse and the seven churches, this is the region of the last one to be right, mentioned. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. So we have to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, there is so much richness archaeologically tying to the letters of Paul and to the apocalypse, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. Revelation. So. How much work has been done at Colossae that we could all invite viewers to go and see and just test for themselves? It's still pretty pristine. Uh, we would call it a tell, but in, uh, in Turkey they call it a huyuk, That's right. which is the same phenomenon where layer after layer has uh, uh, yeah, accumulated risen, over time. Accumulated over right, time. Right. Right. But not much. Now, my understanding is that uh, some of the inscriptions that we know come from Colossae were found on the slopes. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not aware that any excavation has been done, or if mm -hmm. any, very little. Mm -hmm. So it's a different kind of phenomenon than with Ephesus. Right, or with, where there's uh, so much that's been done. Correct, mm -hmm. or Philippi. So mm -hmm. We have those. Chronologically, uh, putting ourselves again into the time period of these two Roman emperors, and then... Warren, you've talked about this cluster of epistles, and they've been called the prison epistles. Mm -hmm. Now we have these last two. <clears throat> yes, well, this is a, a collection of Paul's writings, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and we've now linked Philemon to that, which, uh, according to the, the content of these, imply that Paul was in prison somewhere. He talks about his his imprisonment. He talks about to the Philippians uh, how they're not ashamed of the fact that he's a prisoner and so forth. So he's implying that he's in prison. In some cases, they are sending him things. He's writing from, from there, giving them counsel as their pastor in absentia. And uh, the issue has to do with where was this prison and what was the time frame? Uh, in the slide that we have here, we have assumed, and I think probably rightly so, that this collection of so-called prison letters uh, originated from Rome when Paul was imprisoned there the first time. Uh, the traditions in the book of Acts seem to imply that he was imprisoned uh, to begin with and then was released and later imprisoned in a much more severe environment and executed. 
This would likely have been during his earlier time, which was a time of considerably greater freedom when he had assistants who were coming and going and assisting him there and so forth. So that likely is what ties this set of yeah. materials together. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the interesting things to me <clears throat> is that uh, all those letters to begin with are written to churches and groups of people, but as he comes toward the end of his life, he starts <laughs> writing to specific people, and Philemon <laughs> is the first yeah. of those yeah. three, three, you know, Titus and uh, Timothy. Timothy, yeah. good. Basic background issues, um, you've talked about most of these, uh, Warren. I don't know if there's anything you want to add for this particular church. Well, with regard to uh, <coughs> the date of authorship, we just kind of contextualize that, but right. uh, as, as far as the author, the identification of the author, Paul is identified in the letter as the author. And we talked a little bit about the range of understanding of what it means for someone to be an author in ancient times, quite different from the way we use the, the term today, uh, at least in terms of its breadth of possibilities. And there are some who feel that uh, Paul was not the author in a conventional sense, but was one who is being celebrated by a, a, a later follower uh, of his, a follower of his who later writes uh, in memorializing Paul's ideas and so forth. But for this particular letter, the, the uh, scholarly opinion is, is actually quite divided. I happen to fall on the side of those who see this as a Pauline letter, as a genuine Pauline letter, and it's because of these numerous ties that we have with Philemon that I think uh, suggest to me there is a, a very high likelihood that these documents emerged from Paul, were sent out, delivered by the same person to the same community, basically at the same yeah. time. Good. And you have to take seriously the claim that he has written it himself. I he mean, makes that claim in, in yeah. some, some part of it he's written himself. Right. Yeah. Right. But, but could that just be a signature, okay? Here, here I'm signing it so that you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think your, your argument is quite persuasive about, especially with the relationship with Philemon. Mm. Um, but, but just the words m might be understood in some mm -hmm. different ways. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so an outline. It is, uh, it's not a long book. Uh, that is Colossians, so we look at this one quickly. Um, you have often talked, and talked, Warren, about kind of the standard um, letter format here, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming it's somewhat the same with the conclusion and final greetings at the end, kind of pulling things together, giving some practical advice. Very standard introduction. <coughs> Paul identifies himself as writer, the Christians in Colossa as the readers. He has a little standard formula that he puts into a lot of his letters invoking the name of God, and then has a prayer or a thanksgiving statement or something that right. follows the body of the letter, conclusion and final greeting. So this is very typical of letters of the time, and it's typical of Paul's letters and all the letters in, we have in the New Testament. Okay, now if But we what could, also is typical yeah. is that it is primarily <coughs> theological at the beginning and behavioral and ethical <laughs> toward the end, as he narrows down what he really wants them to do and right. not do, as right, the case right, may right. be. <laughs> okay, now Philemon, just one chapter long. Hmm. Uh, a different format or similar or, I mean, it's more personal, of course. The format is, is, is really exactly the same. It's just that the content, the, the, the body of the letter is so much shorter because it's a very <coughs> focused kind of right. request. He essentially is wanting to say to Philemon, I'm sending Onesimus, your former slave, back to you. He left you and he came to me. Now he's returning as a brother in Christ. I want you to take him back. And he goes through a number of very interesting <coughs> psychological techniques to, yeah. to, uh, to lay it on Philemon that he <laughs> needs to do this. <coughs> Well, and we're going to be thinking about slavery and what it, was to, what it must have meant for um, Philemon to, 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 to allow back somebody whom I assume shamed him in some way. I'm right, assuming that's up. part of it, yeah. right? right if we go back just a moment to the, to the um, Colossian uh, document as far as what is at stake here, this probably represents the highest level of Christological development that we have in Paul. Theological thinking then. The theology of Christ, his pre-existence, his involvement in creation, and all of this is contextualized against 
what some of the ways that ancient people understood the universe in which they lived. Not so much the three-story universe we found in Philippians, but this notion that the planets and the, and the, the heavenly bodies were all representative of, of uh, rulers and powers of the universe and so forth. And there was a sense, I think, in these Colossian Christians that they were, they were willing to bring Jesus Christ into that pantheon right. and make him simply one of these yeah. and give him an appropriate and, and, and prominent place mm -hmm. in this yeah. heavenly structure, right. but not the place that Paul thought Christ should have. <laughs> For he says, <clears throat> he is the one who brought them all about. Right. And in his crucifixion, he and his resurrection, he in effect cre creates a victory over them. He, he uh, is victorious over them. So this is a very interesting kind of, of thing. And these people were, in fact, uh, blending some of this with ascetic Jewish ideas, food laws and other kinds mm -hmm. of things, and, mm -hmm. and uh, veneration of time and days and so forth and seasons. And, he, and so it sounds like a very complex uh, kind of blending of ideas from the community, ideas of Judaism that were in the air. Syncretism, and so we could a, call a it. A kind so. of syncretism, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, the, the two books have much more below the surface. And I, I've thought often that the more you know, the more of these levels you're aware of, the deeper uh, the meaning and significance. That's what archaeologists so are all about. Archaeologists are surface. digging yeah. deeper, too, <laughs> and, and, and text people, right, people right, who study right. text, too. So <laughs> we, we, we belong together on this. So. We've seen a number of these issues, slavery, families. Uh, Warren, you suggested that we should, in, we should bring these two together because slaves were part of families, at least, mm. I guess, the family, the household slaves, mm -hmm. maybe not the others. Um, some of the same concerns with inheritance, circumcision. These things keep showing up in Paul's letters, which suggest they were fairly common issues throughout the empire, throughout the mm -hmm. Roman Empire. And we will be looking at some of these. Slavery, Onesimus. Mm. So this is really significant. And we've talked before about these different levels or types of slavery. So here we have somebody, what, maybe a common laborer? Uh, being whipped into shape? Could be. All <coughs> slaves, of course, were subject to their masters. Mm -hmm. And so even the best of them would, would um, certainly need to obey. Maybe Paul is saying don't do that to, to <laughs> Onesimus when he comes back. <laughs> I, I think it's amazing the mosaics we have that we now can see these images. Mm -hmm. And uh, one like this, this is, I mean, this is, th there are several slaves here working at different kinds of tasks. tasks. Mm -hmm. I don't know if part of it is construction. Um, um, the art historians could certainly help us understand much of it. Um, here, a different kind of slavery, well, at least a different position, and doing some reading. Okay, what's going on here? Hairdresser, maybe, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. with maybe a, a, a brass or bronze mirror through which Paul thought at one point we can only see dimly, mm -hmm. more partly or partially. And here, serving wine, um, serving at a banquet, uh, reclining banquet. Mm -hmm. Now, the next slide I'm only going to hold up there for a quick minute because it illustrates what at least some slaves had to do. I think, I mean, th this particular one is going to be collecting urine, which is used in bleaching uh, wool, I guess. I think you'd mentioned something else, uh, Kent, earlier uh, in conversations off the set here about what some of the tasks that slaves had to do. Sure, they had to collect the urine and they used it in uh, cleaning for, before they dyed the, the wool. And they would just dump it into a big vat and then the slaves would tromp around clean, you know, right. cleaning the, right. tromping the cloth. So some of this was not pleasant. So this is going to be mm -hmm. up here for only a minute, okay? As we look here, at this next slide. Here the slave slide. goes right to the source. Right to the source of the urine. Okay, so we've seen it <laughs> and we're moving on, okay? Uh, but it does illustrate something of the life, at least of some slaves, mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the Roman world. Some slaves had it much better than that. I <laughs> think we would say that that's the case. They, they tutored children, they managed businesses, mm -hmm. they could collect wealth uh, and eventually buy their, their freedom. They could be declared freed by their owners in the lifetime of the owners or 
uh, when the owner passed away, right. and in some cases even could become citizens of the Roman Empire thereby. Right. Mm -hmm. Moving to family, okay, mm -hmm. slavery is certainly a major part of the Roman Empire and of Paul's letters. And we've talked a bit before about, about the kind of fitting into, or, or maybe, let me put it to maybe baptizing or Christianizing the practices that were there. In mm -hmm. other words, this, this is the world in which we live. Let's make our practices the best ones mm -hmm. within the context of our Christian faith and mm -hmm. our ethical principles. Mm -hmm. So which means that the principles across various communities and uh, groups can be the same, but the application can be different because of the customs that different right. groups have. We, I think if, if we were to sit down today and write Paul's letters, we would probably think, you know, our society, that's not where we are. Mm -hmm. um, but in the adopting and adapting, and you talked about the, the way that some of these other, even the, the, the deities, the planets were uh, inculcated, that let's make sure that we're holding true to our principles, our Christian principles. But these things happen with time. We like to talk about progressive revelation, how things develop right. and change, and present truth, right? Right, right. <laughs> but the, the principle, I think, that, uh, that pervades all of this is that you live in a world mm -hmm. That's the reality. That's the context you live in. Not everything about that is, a, is positive. Right. But as a Christian, you have an opportunity of making a difference, mm -hmm. even if you can't overthrow the whole social order. Mm -hmm. In fact, it might not even be desirable in that context to overthrow the social order, mm -hmm. but to provide a way in which Christians can navigate their way through that mm -hmm. and also make a difference to others right. is, I think, the principle that we can take into our world today. Right. And especially within the church, everybody gets treated the same and everyone has an opportunity and brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Right. Yeah. right. And when Paul talks about a family, he talks about those components, which are parents, children, and slaves yeah. for those households who are, could afford to right. have them. Right. And for each of them, there is a, a, an admonition that they play their role in the context of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Which, which has to be fundamental. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I, one might be able to say today that one doesn't have to stay with the norms of society. In fact, there are a lot of things we'd object to. Right. In fact, we wouldn't have... Um, the, the Civil War maybe is a good illustration of how different people were reading different texts. Mm -hmm. um, maybe all of them reading it out of context. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But in, the, in, in our world, um, We've, we've moved past slavery. Well, mm -hmm. we hope we've moved past slavery. Maybe not all people have. The struggle now is, uh, is sometimes uh, gender, right? Right. Equality. Uh, among, other kinds yeah, of issues right. that show up mm -hmm. in our world. It's nice to see so many artistic renditions of families. And so we're going to look at a few of them here. Um, here's one. We have, you see a lot of children here dressed. I think, can't you have your students sometimes study Roman dress? Uh, they do. It's interesting that most of these are these draped clothing. We think of togas and that kind mm -hmm. of um, clothing style. But the reason is very practical. I mean, cloth is expensive to make and it's uh, labor intensive. So why would you want to cut it and throw away parts? That's mm -hmm. fitted clothes that require right. that cutting and right, discarding. Right, right, right. So it's uh, practical. And we have, I mean, we just have several slides here in a row illustrating that same thing. Lots of children in these pictures. Um, people have studied the um, hair. I was going to say hairdo. That's probably a little bit too slang. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any, in any so, case, the hairdressing here. And so uh, art historians can do a lot with mm -hmm. what we have in these depictions. Um, families bringing, family members bringing offerings to uh, probably what? A votive kind of uh, altar. It's like Jupiter. Ah, yes, and sitting there. And then marriage uh, and family issues. Children are a part of that. I, I like this one, this mosaic, <laughs> with maybe that is one of the slave tasks, is taking the children, taking care of the children and giving them a camel ride occasionally. So I've always loved this Roman fresco, actually from Rome, with these two Roman individuals. A lot of detail. You can't see it um, on uh, TV screens, but there are very fine hairs of an attempt at a, mus uh, a mustache. And 
actually peach fuzz. It's, it, this is a young person mm -hmm. who's not been able to develop a full beard. But if you look at it carefully, you can see that he's attempting to. He's <laughs> attempting to make that. And the Roman family, again, lots of these. And funerary reliefs and so on. We have often talked about circumcision, which comes up in all of these letters. So there were people who practiced it. We've seen this before. Um, certainly, but Jews, the main thing Jewish that Paul Christians. is always wanting to say is that you don't have to have uh, Gentiles be circumcised right. the way Jews right. expect right. to be. Which is to say that in coming to Christianity, Jews did not have to pass through right. the sieve of Judaism. Right. Gentiles, Gentiles did not have, didn't to. have to pass through. Gentiles yeah. didn't have to pass through correct. Judaism. Right. 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 Now, see, in a way, that is pushing against a cultural norm. It it's a Jewish it cultural norm, mm -hmm. but it's pushing against it, mm -hmm. which of course created a lot of resistance mm -hmm. in the process. And nowadays, we missionaries need to say that you don't have to uh, become American in mm -hmm. your customs right. when you live in Africa or South which America. Which is kind of how it was before. <laughs> right, right. Kind of the empirical approach to things. And we've seen this particular image before too from uh, Rome with the depiction of the crucifixion. Crucifixion figures strongly in uh, these books, too. Scribes. OK, a new set of group, uh, a new set of characters here. Kent, you like writing and the texts and so on. We have several depictions here of scribes. What this, we this is a great example of actual um, the activity there of writing and, and then reading it. And the scribes were trained. I mean, there were many more literate people in the Greco-Roman world than earlier, but it was still an important trade. And if you needed something documented, you would go to a professional scribe. He could write Is it well right? according to the, right. the forms that were expected. Right. And here, a scribe. I'm not sure what the other people are doing. Maybe they're arguing about what the scribe <laughs> should uh, actually write down. Could be. I'm not sure. And I wonder if this doesn't illustrate, Warren, what you talked about, these, maybe a wider sense of authorship. Um, we certainly have the, 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 the solid core of Paul. Do we have other people? Do we ha should we listen for other voices in the process of reading? Kind of school of Paul, if you know. Mm. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. T speaking of a school, yes. <laughs> um, here's some children um, in, a, in a scribal setting. And in the right, another one of these um, reliefs, uh, stone reliefs, in the left is, is this pensive fresco of mm -hmm. a person, maybe somebody of, the lit of, a, of a literary um, career who's writing. And we see books in both of them, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But we need to finish up with the churches, these house churches. Kent, Capernaum. At Capernaum, there was a house identified in tradition as Peter's house, and it may well have been. But in the later um, early Christian period, it was turned into a more formal church with octagonal walls, right. but still preserving that original house. And so if you go be beneath the octagon, that's where you would find a place that at least seemed to be special, seemed to have some kind of worship significance to it. Right. So, Thank you, Larry, Warren, and Kent, and all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. We hope we've added something to your knowledge and to your faith, and we look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark. <laughs>